this song is about coming to Jerusalem. In the city of gold, I left a little prayer pressed inside your walls of stone. And I pledged my heart to carry out your will if you'd only make it known. You waited until I could hear the tune. Imitzion, Tetzé Torah, Udevashem, Erochemayim. Imitzion, Tetzé Torah, Udevashem. When the desert night sweeps the seven gates and the stars light up the sky, I can hear your voice whispering on the wind when I stop to hear the cry. Your inspiration feeds a hungry world. It's my heartbeat. Can I get you up here to do a little rap on Yerushalayim, yeah? Come right next to me, yeah. Here we go. Take it away. I'll try to come up with something on the spot for the city that's giving me everything that I need. I don't need anything but to breathe and but to eat. When I spend time with my friends here, I find my family here. I'm amongst all these beautiful people that change me. Inspired by the moment, the city that I walk through, the old city. I'm privileged to live here. How can it be that I feel so free in the city of Jerusalem, as old as can be? It's the center of the universe, the center of our galaxy. It gives me everything I need love and society. This place is for me. This place is for me. In the city of gold, this perfect stranger finally feels at home. That's true. I feel that. You can sing. Get him clapping off the beat. Clap hands. Sing it with me. Okay, everybody. Uh, now, that was all light and fluffy, but now we got to get back to the heavy-duty material we're dealing with now. It's our final installment, and I promised everybody here that we would deal with the breakthrough of how do you access truth? How do you actually access truth? Because as we discovered yesterday, we don't have any access to truth. Why? Because we're so darn concerned about what people would say if we were to live that truth. If we were to live the truth that we know is real, if we were to integrate it, 
if we were to integrate things that we knew were true, integrate things that we know were real, in other words, if we were to truly have what character trait? Integrity. integrity. Everyone say that together. Integrity. If we were to truly have integrity and really integrate the stuff we know is real, your life would be awesome. Your life would be amazing because you integrate things that are real. So you become the most real person anyone ever met. But when you lack integrity, when you can't actually integrate the things you know, when it's just information, when it goes in one ear and comes out the other, or it's just like you leave an experience like Aisha Torin, people say, how was it? And you're like, it was interesting. <laughs> you, know, you want to kill someone when they say that? I mean, interesting could be a book, not this. Interesting? Why don't you just kill it? Yeah, or it was informative. Informative? I find that the people who have the most integrity when it comes to learning and knowledge and ideas, the people who have the most integrity are the people that didn't go to college. Why? Because they had four years, and some even more than four years, of information that makes no difference, because there's no time anyway to have it make a difference, because by the time you'd actually integrate it, you're already on to your next subject, and you got high pressure exams, and you gotta somehow regurgitate all this information onto an exam, and nothing's changed. It can't touch you that way. And the pressure's on in the next semester and the next semester, and you just gotta just keep putting it out and putting it out and putting it out. And but the problem is you never put it in. And what happens is the the, the but the, that sounds lousy, but the damage is you stop believing that ideas change you. Because you just went through four years of pure ideas and they didn't make a difference. And so you start living your life in a way where things just kind of are like a scrolling marquee. Life's just a scrolling marquee of ideas as it doesn't touch me. And who wants to live in a world where, where you're not touched anymore? Because once you're not growing, you're not alive. As we know very well in our tradition that the meaning of life is more important than life itself. The Greeks didn't want our bodies. They were, go ahead and live, man. Go to the gym. You should have a beautiful body. Greeks had nothing against our bodies. They were against our spirituality. They were against the meaning of life. They were against the ideas that change humanity. That's what they were against. And so for that, we risked our lives. That is when the Maccabees went ballistic. Because our meaning in life is more important than life itself. And I'd rather die saving the world's for its meaning than live, a, em, live an empty life. Mm -hmm. But when we integrate information and we let the ideas touch us and they change us and we become the information that we learn, that we're actually living full, with full integrity, you're amazing. You're the most real person anyone knows. And you become, in this generation, you become a beacon for truth. Meaning you can make a massive difference for the people who know you, or you can make no difference. And while the world is right now on a very slippery slope, everyone's kind of going down a cascade to oblivion, you know, just like total lost, lost tribe. And the only tribe that didn't get lost, well, the two tribes were Judah, our tribe, the Jews, and then there was the Kohanim. The only two tribes that didn't get lost are so lost, they're, they're, and they're like an endangered species today. And so we're gonna be more worried about what they think of us, and then we don't make a difference. Because if you're worried what they'll think of you, so you're gonna just stay the same and never change and never grow, because you're so worried what will they say if I were to change and grow. So then in the end, everyone goes down the river together. And Niagara Falls is at the end of that river. That's the end of it. And Hitler laughs. Nebuchadnezzar laughs. And the Inquisitors laugh. Everyone laughs. And the Shekhinah cries. God's presence cries. And then we didn't make a difference. Your families are counting on you right now. You are, you've been sent here. <laughs> I know some of you have families that don't think you even should be here right now, but your families, 
Your families have spiritually, they've spiritually sent you to Israel with a really thick rope. And they're expecting, once you get it, and once you're like really in it, to just start going like this and just pulling them out, pulling them out, pulling them out, pulling them out, pulling them out. Because society is, again, it's going down a cascade. It's like, it's really unstoppable at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, the train's arriving in Auschwitz. It's just that, they, that because someone knows you, they've got their hand out of the train and you're living like a, you're like a, a part, a par, how do you call it partisan? How do you say it in, in English? And the people who lived in the forest? Partisan. Mm -hmm. partisan. So uh, you're like a partisan in the forest who can come and pull people out. Or... Or you can just pretend like nothing happened here, like so many people do. That the majority of them leave as if nothing even happened. Because it's going to rock the boat, and it's not going to look good, and it's going to upset my mom, and it's going to upset my dad, and it's going to upset this one, or accept that, upset that one, or accept this one, whatever. And then we don't make a difference. And so there's a lot on the line. But what I promised today was to to sh share with you guys how to diffuse this whole thing so that you never are worried whatsoever of what they'll think of you. Because the thing that blocks our access to truth more than anything else is what will they say? What will they say about me? So-and-so freaked out. They went to Israel, freaked out, went turbo Jew, they're all religious now. You know, and they, and they want to say it. They just totally want to say it. And, they, and, and we don't want the ridicule. It's the number one thing in the way of us being effective as rabbis. It has nothing to do with the information and nothing to do with the intellect of those hearing the information. It all boils down to two major issues. One, integrity, and two, what will they say? We live in a world where you, you don't have to be your information. You don't have to be it. It's, it's, there's, you don't have to integrate information. And two is, what will they say? Yesterday, we spoke about why they, why they get so upset. What, what's their issue? What do they care? And we found out yesterday that for them to be them, they need what? They need you to keep playing the games. Meaning when you stop playing the game of where you're from, it causes them a tremendous insecurity because they don't know who they are. I mean, who are we anyway? Human beings are so fragile. I mean, we know who we are. You know what the difference between a secular Jew and a religious Jew is? Secular Jew is pretending he knows what he's doing, and a religious Jew admits that he has no idea what he's doing, and he's trying to use the Torah to, as a compass to somehow get some sort of sense of sanity. But who's more likely to make it? Someone who knows he's lost or someone who thinks he knows where he is when he's absolutely lost? So someone who knows he's lost a lot more likely to find civilization, find reality. There's another issue that we didn't bring up in solving this whole puzzle of living with integrity no matter what anyone says and just stop caring what people think so that you can live the truth. There's one thing we didn't bring up. And that is that these people in our lives that we're so worried about what they'll think, they also want to look good. It's important, for, just like it's important to you that people, like, you know, uh, how do you say hold of you in English? Uh, people, uh, regard. what? Regard you. regard you in high regard, you know, think you're smart, think you're significant, think you make, you know, you matter. and think that you know what you're doing. And we want that. We want people to think we're with it. It's really important to us. That's our support system. Because again, human beings are fragile. And it's the people that are closest to us who give us our, our feeling we're okay. And that's really important for us. Okay, not at such a big price though. I mean, to have that over truth, to have that over your whole pursuit of reality, that's, that's too much expensive. But the people themselves have this same issue. They want to be held in high regard. And there's something about having a child or a sibling 
or another relative or good friend who went turbo with their Judaism. If they, for them, it's embarrassing. I remember my father, he used to tell people that, that I was studying in Israel to be a rabbi. He would lie and say he was studying, because he was embarrassed, because he wants to look good. He doesn't look good in West L.A. Anyone know Brentwood? Los Angeles? Anyone heard of Brentwood? No. Yeah? It's, not, it's just not high on the list of like things you talk about at social events about what your kid's doing, you know? <laughs> Studying in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess it's better than like terminal illness or something, you know? <laughs> I guess it's better than being in jail. I, okay. So for my father, it was embarrassing. And so he would tell everyone I'm studying to be a rabbi. I wasn't studying to be a rabbi. And I even passed up. For many, Aish uh, kept asking me, as the rabbinic program, every year and a half, two years, it would come around. They'd say, Rabbi Glaze, no rabbi, no rabbi. They'd say, Yom Tov, maybe you'll join this group. And I'd say, I'm not here to be a rabbi. I'm not here to study to be a rabbi. And I'd pass that group. And then another two years, they would wait. And then, how about now? No. Nope. You know why I did it? For the following scenario. That when I'd be visiting at some wedding or family event in LA, so Aunt Marge would come up with me and say, so, she had moved from the East Coast, so, <laughs> Yom Tov, or sorry, Johnny, Johnny, what's it like to be in Jerusalem studying to be a rabbi? <laughs> and I would say, uh, Aunt Ethel, uh, I don't know who told you that. Where'd you hear that? And she's like, your father, of course. <laughs> You're not studying to be a rabbi in Jerusalem? And I'm like, no. <laughs> what are you doing over there? I'm like, well, you know, I'm Jewish. And I was robbed. And no one taught me anything about what that means. I was never taught Torah. And frankly, I'm just trying to catch up with six-year-olds. <laughs> and she was like, Marge, Marge, how you doing, Marge? <laughs> she walks away. That's why I kept passing up the rabbinic, or, you know, the rabbinic, uh, you know, uh, or, ordination program, because I didn't want to ever give it to them. I didn't want to give it to them. The last thing I wanted was to be a rabbi and let them all say, see, he studied to be a rabbi. Let's see, I became a rabbi in 99, I got here in 91. <laughs> I was pretty tough about it. But it was, I, the writing was on the wall, it seemed I was gonna be able to touch people. And anyway, the, they're concerned about what they look like. You're worried about what you look like. Well, guess what? They're concerned what they look like. What does it mean to have a daughter who's like freaked out and like suddenly can't just eat an apple without saying all these incantations? You know, what's it mean to dress, a, dress you know, in a sneeous way, in a modest way on a 90 degree summer day? And you know, it's uncomfortable for people who are fashion conscious to be hanging out with someone who's wearing, you know, more fabric than that other person's worn all week in one go, you know. The, the life of a, a real Jewish life just doesn't look good when, when in the eyes of the world at large, and it, and it is embarrassing for people because they're wondering what people are thinking about them. So let's just take a quick inventory here. We're not doing what we know is true, meaning we're giving up our integrity because what will they say about us? And the they who are, we're wondering what they'll say about us, what are they doing? They're doing the same thing. They're doing the exact same thing. Their whole concern is what will they think of me? What are, what are people gonna think of me if I have this like freaked out friend? or freaked out sibling, or freaked out child, or they're doing what we're doing. And so, at what point do this thing stop? 
because listen to this, we're trading our integrity. What's our integrity mean? It's what I really feel I should be doing in this world. That's it. Meaning I feel I should be at Shabbat dinner in this world. But it's also, this world doesn't even exist. I mean, if you guys know any physics or if you've had any mushrooms or if you've uh, <laughs> studied any Kabbalah or any, I mean, if you said Shema loud enough, I don't know. If you, you know this world's not real. This world is paper thin. This world is an illusion. All there really is, is Hashem. All there is is Hashem. There's only Hashem. That's all there is, is Hashem. And so you're not only giving up what you do in this world, but when your soul moves on, and the Jewish soul has like a big, big like adventure to go on because of all the mitzvahs that the Jewish soul did. So when the Jewish soul goes on, for the next level of adventure, it's like there's not much there. Because all those mitzvahs, all those mitzvahs that were going to be the castle in the sky that we live in, whatever that means, we don't know what is there. But it's, we know it's outside space and time. We know it's super, super intense, super complex. It's made of wisdom. All of it's made of wisdom. The whole next world's made of wisdom. And, and uh, you know, with, with these near-death experience people, people who die in hospital tables and they bring them back to life, they all say it's filled with wisdom. And they come back, they could be like trash truck. You know, you know that guy hanging on the back of the trash truck? Yeah, I guess he, he lost his grip or something. He, he died, you know, in some crazy crash. They shouldn't be on the back of that thing on a highway anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and they... And then they got him back to life. They used the, you know, the PJCs, the people jumper cables, and they got him, boom. And he got back to life. And all of a sudden, he becomes a voracious reader. Like he comes back to this world, and the guy's like, he can't stop reading more and more and more because he realizes that all there is is wisdom. That's all there is. These walls are made of wisdom. Everything's made of knowledge. Everything's just information. My voice is coming in pure mathematical information across the room. Everything's information. And when you get to the other side of this, then you see the real, like, 3D experience of, of the wisdom, of the chachma of creation is all on the other side. Why do you think Jews spend so much time in Torah? Our whole lives are, like, in the Torah because that's what the whole thing's made of. Let me explain. There are two Torahs. There's an upper Torah and there's a lower Torah. They're really the same Torah, but one is like, have you ever been, in the old days, they used to have in airplanes, and the very first, my family had one of those big screen, the very first big screen TV. It had an RBG projector, a red, blue, green projector, which projected three colors, red, blue, and green. And I, I was on an airplane actually about five years ago that still had one. <laughs> I'm talking about the RBG projector. So, so I'm looking on this side's Harrison Ford, like, acting. And over here is a red, blue, and green light. It looks like a disco light or something. And I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the screen, I'm looking at it. And they, I know that somehow in there is embedded this movie. So that upper Torah, there's an upper Torah that Hashem, it says Hashem looked into the creation, this is what it says in the Zohar. Hashem looked into creation and created the world. Everything's created from that. And that's the Torah. He, did I say he looked into the creation? Yeah. Yeah. He looked into the Torah and created the world. He, he, he looked into the Torah and created the world. What do you mean he looked in the Torah? The Torah didn't come in Mount Sinai like 2,500 years later? No. He looked into the Torah. What Torah? And the answer is the Torah that is the blueprint of creation. And from that Torah, God created the world. Now what happened? That Torah shoots down the information, which is very matrix-like. Have you ever seen the matrix with the numbers coming down? So the actual Aleph bet, the Aleph bet is all going in, it's coming down like a Yud is then hitting a Vav and it's cruising down. Hays are cruising down like that with a little thing coming down. Lamas are sending things diagonally and shooting things are sometimes switching rows. The actual intercalculation of everything is 231, but it's exponential mathematics. So it's 231 gates that the holy 22 letters of the Aleph go through, 231. 
Because if you do, it's an algorithm. If you do uh, Aleph, Bet, Aleph, Gimel, Aleph, Dalet, right? Bet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Bet, Dalet. You go through all of that. So these are all intercalculating and they're weaving. These letters are we literally weaving creation. And so this wood is made of those letters. You just can't see the wisdom. You see the, t you see the wood. Everything's made of this. Everything's made of this wisdom. But that wisdom is coming from the upper Torah. It's being beamed into existence from the upper Torah. And it's intercalculating until it finally locks into this world. So if I took a picture, um, you know, imagine I, you take your iPhone or whatever, and you take a picture of, of those letters interweaving, like the upper Torah, as it weaves. It moves. It's alive. Like the upper Torah is alive. So if you take a picture of the upper Torah at any point, while it's making its way down with all the calculations, so you'd have a picture then of Torah, just wherever you got to in the parallel realm. It's everything's going on in parallel worlds. They're called olamos. Okay? So if you take a picture of it, that's Torah. And now it's woven more. You take a picture of it. What is it? Torah. Okay. Go, come with, uh, work with me here. <laughs> you take a picture of a low snapshot. Okay, what is that? It's Torah. So there's Kabbalists who know how to go there. And there's also, ready for this? There are also uh, mystics throughout other cultures who also know how to go there. To that world, they know how to go. Yeah. And you guess who taught them? Avram Avinu taught them. After Sarah died, he remarries a woman named Keturah. And we have a Keturah right here. Yeah, is it Keturah like her or Keturah? Keturah like her. Oh, Keturah. I've been calling you Keturah this whole time. You've been letting me. No, because I thought I asked you the very first day. So he remarries, Avram remarries a woman named Keturah, which means incense. And he marries Keturah, and she has six children. And I, this is not oral tradition, I'm quoting the written door. Okay, she has six children, and he's, it says he gave everything he had to Isaac. But to the six children of Keturah, he gave gifts and sent them eastward, away from Isaac, to the land of the east. It is by no coincidence that Hinduism says that it comes from the west of the Euphrates, right at the time of Abraham's life. That's the beginning of Hinduism. It's right at the time, and that's their tradition. And they have a caste system, and what's the highest caste? Brahmins, Brahmins, Abraham. Highest caste is, is Brahmin. Yeah, the, it's all that. If you go here, there's stuff, and there's stuff's crazy whack, like, you know, whack stuff. I mean, it's insane deity stuff, and energies, and, and all kinds of demonic, crazy stuff, which they don't consider demonic, but they don't know that it's demonic. Now, do you think Abraham wanted to send them? Because think about it. What does it say? He gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the six children he gave gifts. What's the obvious question? If he gave all that he had to Isaac, what are the gifts? So the answer is, is that Abraham taught them the whole spiritual universe, and he taught them about the wisdom. It's all wisdom. But he taught them what to watch out for in those worlds. And what happened was they were like, yeah, at first it was cool, but then after a while, you can see the Rambam explains all of this. After a while, they were like, started losing touch a little bit with the creator of the universe and started kind of getting into the whole, you know, because they knew all the info of all the matrix, all the parallel worlds. And they just stopped forgetting about the CEO, so to speak. Meaning like, if Abraham knew the CEO, so when he ordered checkbooks from the bank, he just called Uncle Joe and said, Uncle Joe, I just need some checkbooks. He's like, okay, they'll be at your doorstep in a couple hours. But uh, what happened was the, the children of Abraham that went to the east, they started going to the teller, so to speak. They, they go to the bank teller. Even though there's a CEO, they just don't think you can speak to the CEO. They didn't realize that's available, <coughs> speaking to the CEO. That's a Jewish tradition. You'll notice anyone we've touched throughout history whether it's Christian, Muslim, everyone thinks they can talk to God. Like, where do they, who do they think they are talking to the CEO? But you'll see, anywhere Jews lived, they all think you can talk to the CEO, which is cool, because you can. And the Easterners just never knew you could talk to them. And when you understand, and Easterners really understand the worlds, the parallel worlds, they got it down. When you start seeing the vastness of it, and then you realize you can talk to the CEO, it blows your mind. 
that something this powerful and this complex that the human brain really could never get around unless you spent your entire life studying it, and still you wouldn't. And you get to talk to the CEO. So they, after a while, just said, like, who do we think we are to talk to the CEO? And so they only talk to the, they talk to the intermediaries. They talk to the middlemen, the tellers, the bank tellers. We've covered so much stuff. Let's just rebuild this here. Uh, we spoke about integrity, that the thing in the way of integrity is two. One is we don't think ideas change us anymore because we've been so busy like seeing the world as a scrolling marquee. Two is we can't integrate things because we're so worried what people might think of us. But what we discovered today is that everyone that we're worried what they think of us are actually worried what people are going to think of them. In other words, we're giving it all up for nothing, for zero, zero. You want to look good for people who are looking good? Who are looking good for people who are looking good for people who are looking good for people who are looking good. And so you wind up giving up. And all this crazy, we've been on this like crazy tangent. All because I was just trying to say that you give up this world. You think you're giving up this world. Meaning the stuff you do, if you integrated everything you learned in life, and you integrated and started living it, so that's the stuff you'd be doing here. But what I was trying to say is you're actually giving up next world as well. But then what I started saying is, meaning you're giving up both worlds for what? What do you trade it for? Because normally you trade things for, you, know, you gotta get something. When you trade something, you usually get some. Yeah, you did trade it to get some. You know what you got? You got to look good for people. Yeah? You got to look good for people who are looking good for people who are looking good for people who are looking good for people who are looking. So what'd you get? What'd you trade it for? Nothing. nothing. That's the point. That's the point I wanted to tell you guys today, is that you're trading it for nothing. Because I promise you, the most judgmental person you know who would just totally cream you with Lush and Horror. You know what Lush and Horror is? Yeah. Who would cream you for Lush and Horror for whatever you took on here in Israel. They would just smear your name to the end for what you did by you getting all turboed here. That person is the most concerned with what people think of her. She's just, she has to do it to make herself feel okay. So it had nothing to do with you, it had to do with her. And so we give up both worlds for nothing, but what I was trying to tell you is both worlds are one world. It's all the same world. It's just that here is on the other end of all of those intercalculations. And when you die and your body is buried, your neshama, your soul, goes straight to the real information, like the real realm of wisdom. Because here you can't see the wisdom. There you can see the wisdom. And so you wind up missing out on all the wisdom there because you spent this world, you know, constantly like a, you know, like a dog, no offense, like a dog. <laughs> I was like, did he just say it? I'm spending my life like a dog? Um, <laughs> no, what I mean by a dog is that when you walk a dog, it looks like it's leading you, you know, it looks like it's leading. Except what's it do every time it comes to a corner and doesn't know which way to go, what's it do? <laughs> it looks back. It looks back, oh, where's everyone going here, okay? Oh, okay, we're going that way. Is that, that's the way we look, we're all independent. I did it my way, you know, except we're always like, make sure everyone's watching, make sure it's the way everyone's going here. I mean, we're all, we're all, we're sheep. We're sheep. I just came from the desert just now. We ran into flock after flock of sheep and I, I commented to my son, I said, uh, isn't it amazing how they all follow each other? Is that the way you want? Is that the life you want? And, the, and when really you're in the wisdom, this is the wisdom. You just can't see it. So the wisdom's like this stuff. So everyone work with me and we'll finish with this. I take a picture of the upper worlds. Yeah, I take a snapshot of it. What am I looking at? Tar, tar. Tar. I take a snapshot where it's woven more. Picture, what is it? Tar. tar. Now it's really starting to weave. Yeah, I take a picture of it. And then it finally weaves into physicality. Okay, you ready? Everyone smile. One, two, three. Torah. What's that a picture of? It's your classroom. What is it? Answer? It's Torah. Guys, you've been thinking, you have erroneously been thinking this whole time that you've been in Jerusalem. You've been thinking that Torah is something you study. It's something external, and, and you're, it's a decision you make. Like, am I in or am I out? It's not an in or out on the wisdom of creation. 
There's not an in or out on the actual blueprint of the creation itself. You're always in it. The question is, do you want to be in it and be tuned in, or do you want to be in it and tuned out? You'll never be outside of it. You're always in it. There is nothing else. It's the wisdom of creation. And then you probably wonder, well, what is this book about Moses and you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jay? What's that actual stuff on the parchment that we study all the time? That's because after two and a half millennia of the world being very dense, God just said, this particular planet needs a little crutch. And so he gave us, he gave us the actual owner's manual so that when you go out there and you do business or you go out and you make a wedding or you try to raise a family or you, you, know, you try to build a home and all that stuff, so you can actually open up the instructions for how to treat other people as one. Because when you do business, you try to make money, you get in a lot of arguments. There's all kinds of stuff that you never thought you'd argue about, but they always come up. And we have several tractates of Talmud alone that are straight out of the Torah. You just click on the Torah, it takes you to a hyperlink to, to a website that's all the law of real estate law. It's called Baba Basra. And it goes into all that stuff. So that why? So that you can treat the other person that you're arguing with as one. Because there's only wisdom. That's all there is. You and I are the same. But we now have an argument, and now we, the, the Torah will settle it. Because we live by the wisdom of the actual blueprint. It's a crutch, in a way. Because the world was a little dense. And so God gave our planet this book. Learn the Torah. Go out and live your life. Shalom, everyone. Shalom.